and it's not actually the result of beating that person that is worthwhile it's the result of getting more than you would have done if you weren't in that yeah. competition you mean i remember kind of going through this experience when i was starting to build the business and i noticed that there were loads of opportunities to to get new business that people were just turning down left right and center because it kind of it didn't look glamorous or it didn't make them it didn't kind of put them on a pedestal or it didn't serve their ego but i was like i'll take business i'll take any business i can get lost about seven grand a month of recurring business in the first week if things recovered new clients come in you always do get through it as much as i didn't want to let other people down i would have regretted letting myself down yes that's right we have another guest for you this week i had the pleasure of sitting down with sam winsbury founder of Corogo, a company building amazing personal brands for ceos and company founders personal branding is the reason why people like elon musk has never had to spend a penny on advertising why the likes of Gary Vaynerchuk can charge six figures for a keynote. But it's not all about just being a celebrity or having everybody see you. It's about having the right people see you. And when they do, being positioned as the right person to help. What I love most about this conversation is the raw honesty. Sam doesn't sugarcoat his success or even the struggles. And from this transparency, you can see just how much he's learned in his journey and how much better of an entrepreneur he is because of the hard times. He's already accomplished so much at the age of 23, but I have no doubt that he's just getting started. And I have even less doubt that Kurogo will be the go-to place in the forefront of the personal branding industry. But that's enough of me. Let's get into it. Okay, awesome. I'm happy to go if you are. Let's do it. Cool. Hi there, welcome to Director's Debrief, episode 30, I believe. We're joined by Sam Winsbury today, and I'm gonna do a bit of an introduction for you. But I thought, firstly, we're gonna be talking about yourself as an entrepreneur and as a business. So I thought I'd let you introduce both uh, briefly before we, we dive deeper into them. Yeah, I appreciate it. So Sam Winsbury, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Corogo, and what we do is we help founders and CEOs build powerful personal brands. The coolest thing, I think, before we get to too further into is the name Kurogu. Could you explain a bit about why what that name means and why you went for it? Yeah, everyone loves this. Yeah. <laughs> so Kurogu, originally we were Brandly, and yes. Brandly was kind of the business that I set up when I was just a glorified freelancer. Basically. <laughs> and then as we started developing, started hiring our first few people, it was actually my now COO Lewis at the time that said. Um, I think the, basically the condition of Lewis coming on was that we rebranded. Okay. He said Brandly doesn't do us justice in terms of where we want to go. We want to be the go-to personal branding agency globally working with some of the most exciting entrepreneurs and Brandly just didn't quite do that. It wasn't a brand. Yeah. So we were doing a lot of research trying to figure out a new name and I stumbled across this concept from Japanese theatre called Kuroko. Yeah. And the Kurokos were stagehands mm. that operated in the background of plays but they wore all black or whatever the color of the, the back of the set was, usually all black, so that nobody could see them. So they're doing all this work in the background, moving around, basically making the main act look good, let yeah. them do their job really well, moving props around, setting scenes, etc. And that is kind of what we want to be to our clients, right? We want to be the people in the background, giving them the mic, giving them the platform, giving them the stage so that they can show their work and not really take an awful lot of credit for it ourselves. That's really cool. and. Forgive me for saying, it sounds almost counterintuitive, right? Because you have to promote yourself as a business, yeah. right? So you kind of have to hide behind the scenes. We are very active ourselves in terms of like most of our team have super strong personal brands. We're kind of all over socials, really. Yeah. But it's more for our clients. We don't want anyone to know that our clients have a team of personal brand right. people behind them, right? It should just look like it's them. So we don't want to take credit for the client's work. We don't want to be seen in that. But absolutely, we're, we're pretty pretty active ourselves <laughs> when you were at brandley you call yourself a, a glorified freelancer yeah i was it was i was a one-man band that yeah had an agency website how old were you when you did that i was i came straight out of uni so i think brandley officially started in the summer of 2020 so i would have okay. just turned 21 before we get too far down the business i want to hear about you mm. um and sort of the first question, I guess, is when you were, let's say, like 11 years old, what was the future looking like for you? What did, what was your, I think that's when we were at our purest, right? That's when we see what we really want to do. What did you want to do when you were at that age? All sorts. Throughout my teens, like, it changed so many times. At 11, probably wanted to be a footballer or yeah. a rugby sevens player or something. And then I think I went through phases of physio, all sorts of different sports, be an athlete, um, be a psychologist. Mm 
all sorts of different things, but I never really settled on one thing for too long. So it was a, it was a number of different things, all the way from like eleven up to seventeen, eighteen. Yeah, but I was just kind of never. I mean, you can't really have any idea. No, no. Like, uh, well, Ash likes to say you really can, but it can change just as quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's exactly what it was. I was like so set on right. I'm going to be a sevens player, or yeah. right. I'm going to be a psychologist. But yeah. then the psychologist. Year, yeah, well, I studied psychology at uni. Oh, it's amazing. always been an interest. Yeah, and that's kind of how I got into marketing and entrepreneurship in the first place. Can that? So that follows on to my next question. What made you move towards what you do now, which is personal branding and, and yeah. things like that? Yeah. So always been quite entrepreneurial ever since sixth form at school. Yeah. had an interest in psychology didn't know much about marketing at this stage but was really interested in psychology and wanted to love the idea of creating something for myself Yeah. so whilst I was doing my A-levels I just started a psychology blog oh, it was cool. kind of the first project or business so to speak that I ever had and um, yeah it was just learn- sharing things that I was learning when I was doing extra research on psychology my school didn't offer it wanted to, to, to study at uni so I wrote this blog um, continued that for a few years and then through that started discovering the works of, you know, the likes of Daniel Kahneman, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, I don't know if you've read that amazing book on system one and system two thinking, rationality essentially. Um, and that kind of transitioned me into the world of marketing. Yeah. Because suddenly I was realizing actually people are using these psychological principles to grow businesses. Can I use some of the psychological principles on my own psychology blog? So I started kind of understanding the psychology behind marketing and then got into marketing more and more started looking for freelance projects um, as I was looking for freelance projects that's when people started reaching out to me for help with their personal brands I'm sensing a bit of a theme here and I did some digging into you before we got started here which is that you're very active rather than reactive if I look back to how like I grew up I tend to be very reactive to the situation that I'm in and that might be because of how I grew up and sort of where I grew up but you are a member of the legacy club you're very active and you're still play football we'll get into that in a little bit um but you seem to be doing a lot of the stuff of you going to go do that you're very i hate to use the word but motivated almost mm. um where do you think that comes from it's a good question it's self-starting right like, yeah that, that, that's a better of, way to say it I self-starting you, like you it's kind of just been ingrained in me yeah like i think it's it's probably an upbringing thing um so credit to my parents i guess yeah. i've always just kind of had this um this drive to to do well so to speak yeah and I think that translated into realizing that I can actually just create something from nothing. I think when I started the psychology blog, it was more a passion project, but then I found out actually you can create something from nothing yeah. relatively easy. And I think I kind of got addicted to that a little bit, got addicted to ambition a little bit. You don't seem to hesitate about thinking whether you can or can't do something though. From, from all of this, it's like create something from nothing. There's a lot of people I know that there's a lot of like anxiety barriers in between, and I'm not getting that from you. Um, and you say that you say credit to your parents. Are your parents entrepreneurs? Are they? What's their sort of background like? Yeah. So dad's unfortunately not with us anymore, oh. but he um, he was quite entrepreneurial. He had a number of different jobs. I think he started a few businesses himself, but he was quite entrepreneurial, very driven. Yeah. Um, worked very very hard. Mum runs her own business. She until I was about probably ten, hmm. she was um, stay at home mum. Yeah. So my parents were together up until I was about 10. Um, and then, yeah, mum started her own business, which is a coach, essentially, and does some amazing work now. So she's kind of got that as well. I think it's, it definitely comes from the parents. Yeah. Um, but yeah, hard work was definitely just in- ingrained in me from young age. And you mentioned football. Um, and there's a couple of things that I want to dive into here. But firstly, just in general, as a as a thing that you've done pretty consistently throughout your life, do you think your involvement in sports and to some extent team sports, has helped you as an entrepreneur? Do you think it's shaped you as a person? Aside from the amazing upbringing that I credit my parents for, mm. sport has been the number one factor yeah. in my life and driving everything. I think it just always played, football, rugby, cricket have been the main ones since I was literally, since I could walk pretty much. Yeah. And I think that the the competitiveness of it, but also the like collectiveness that you have as a team, all team sports obviously, um, the ambition that you get collectively, the leadership required, the teamwork, all skills that translate mm. so well into business. I've learned ridiculous amount of lessons about business from sport. Can you think of any specific examples? Yeah, so uh, even the way you operate a team. So yeah. make no mistake, leading a, a team in business is 
it makes leading a sports team look like Mickey Mouse leadership. Like it's leading, <laughs> yeah. I've led sports teams all the way through my life. And yeah. when you compare that to leading a business team, it is just like different stratosphere. Yeah. But the idea of a high performance team is something that I've taken into business massively. Most people say like your business should feel like a family. I think bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> it should feel like a high performance sports team. If put put my family, my actual family up against one of the best sports, pick a best sports team in the world. You can think of like the All Blacks rugby team, uh, Liverpool football teams, anyone you like, Mercedes F1 team from the past few years. Yeah. Give us any task and the sports team will win. So like <laughs> operating like a sports team and that, that high performance attitude of constantly being better, yeah. I think is, is massive. There is a weird lesson that I think I was trying to, I was looking through these questions on the train over here and I was trying to think about some, I always believe the the sports that I follow, I've been a lot more focused on, I played football growing up, I wasn't that into it, so it, after like high school I stopped, but motorsport has been a, a consistent thing in my in my whole life. And I was trying to think of like what lessons, and, and now I'm, I'm big into sim racing and the lessons that I've learned. One of the ones was, what actually before I say this, what do you think of people that say you should always give 110%? It's, I'm about to I'll shit on it, so. It's, <laughs> it's not sustainable. Yeah. I, have a thing, I don't think you should even operate at 100%. I think you should operate at 80%. I'm so glad you said that. That ties in beautifully <laughs> with what I, what I was about okay, to say. Can... <laughs> um, one, I come from a lineage of math teachers, so like 110% is just bad maths. It just it sits really badly with me. I mean, there's the obvious. Yeah. There's the obvious problem. It's like my brother, my dad, and my grand, like all maths teachers. So to say that really rubs me the wrong way. Um, but yeah, I, I thought of this. I was like, always run at 90%. Always operate at 90% is a good thing. I, I, you went with, with 80, but in terms of when you look at Formula One race drivers and when they talk about, Charles Leclerc in the last race said something. He said, it's really going to hurt my race time, not my lap time, not this current lap. They don't consider it as a lap by lap thing. They, they break it down into manageable chunks, but he's already thinking, I'm trying to run a 56 minute race, a 57 minute race. And so you got to leave something on the table, otherwise you'll make mistakes. And I was thinking this because I was, I was trying to like clear my head and I was listening to really soothing music. Or as I do this before like online races and stuff, because for me getting in the zone is like relaxing a little bit, is like getting just below to 90. So that's why I think peak performance comes in because that's more sustainable. And you yeah. say you agree with that? Yeah, it's a, it's a sustainable level of confidence, I think. Is okay. The key thing. Like you can't get too erratic. Um, I said so my the eighty percent principle I mentioned is like if you're if you're operating at one hundred percent all the time and this comes more into say training than a race day or a match day yeah but it translates into business perfectly if you're always operating at one hundred percent in business for example five days out of five every week you're you're flat out no room to kind of step back at all it's not sustainable first of all but also you leave no room for training and improvement. Uh, so yeah. my 80% rule is operate as close to 80% of your capacity as you possibly can. Yeah. And then what you can do is spend that final 20% essentially increasing the capacity, training, reflecting, improving, learning what you can do next week yeah. to get better. And that way next week, 100% of your capacity is higher. So the 80% that you operate at increases as well. Yeah, yeah. And eventually you get to a stage where 80% of my operating capacity now will far exceed 100% of it in five weeks time the other way around 100% of it now will be far yeah. exceeded by 80% in a month's yeah, time yeah. because I'm using that 20% to incrementally increase yeah. so you're essentially operating at 80% all the time but the whole capacity gets larger and larger and larger yes. so 80% of that becomes larger as well so your what you'd say is your 100% today is probably your next month's 80% because exactly. of the, the work that you've put in exactly incredible but if you're always at 100% then that 100% can't increase yeah. it's just staying there amazing it's a very good way to sort of contextualize <laughs> that. So a bit of a weird one. Did you learn that lesson the hard way? Has there been things along the road where you're like, you know, maybe burnout or like just, yeah. It, did you learn that lesson the hard way? Oh, have I? Have yeah. I? Burnout. I learned it. It became clear quite recently. Okay. Uh, more with hiring a team. So we've right. gone, we've gone from three to fifteenth member joins on Monday. Cool. So we went from like three to three to thirteen in six months. Yeah. And suddenly we had a lot, a lot of people joining over May and June, March, April, May, June. And I noticed that we were under capacity a little bit. So yeah. people were basically flat out. And I was trying to kind of train people, trying to get improvements to happen. And, and it just wasn't happening. But then actually I stepped back and I realized it's not, it was none of the team's fault because there simply wasn't room in yeah. their schedule to step back. 
but now we've got much more capacity within the team they're all closer to 80 percent. they can spend that time improving so it was fortunately there were no massive mistakes but it was kind of like seeing over a few weeks okay we're seeing the same issues over and over again here yeah potentially people are, are at capacity there's no room for improvement have you felt it in yourself because i when I, I listen to all the podcasts, right, I read all the books about how to take care of yourself in certain scenarios, and I always dismiss every little bullet point. I'm like, if, if this is the thing, I'm like, no, no, they clearly thought they were burning out, and that's what happened there. I didn't realize that was like a subconscious thing. I don't think I felt like true burnout, but I've started, in certain scenarios, seeing physical manifest, like I've got a patch of my beard here. <laughs> and and that, I've realized that pops up whenever I'm stressed, whenever I'm going through like a very busy phase of my life that pops up. So I'm just curious, have you seen any or felt anything or is, is it been much more passive where you reevaluate and go, actually, the last six months have been pretty rough? I go through loads of experiences of like mini burnouts. Yeah. Basically, I had one start of the year. The first week of January was easily one of the hardest of my life. And then throughout June, June to be fair, was a very difficult month. Okay. Uh, but I tend to find it's, Ollie mentioned this on a recent podcast, mm. one of Ollie Duffy Lee's podcasts, that burnout comes. It's not necessarily, it's not always the work you're doing, but actually, or it's not the amount of time that you're working, but the work you're doing. Yeah. So if it's work that you don't enjoy, work that is high stress, you're gonna burn out a lot quicker. And that's what I found. There's work that I could do yeah. that I enjoy, and I could probably just do it con constantly, nonstop, and I think I'd be okay. But it's when you have the stresses of, you know, stepping into roles that you're not used to or you don't enjoy doing, yeah. that's when I find it becomes becomes worse. I noticed in the barber, the last time I got my hair cut, yeah. in the barbers, the guy's combing, I'm going, oh my God, is that my hair like? <laughs> I've never had that before. <laughs> the first time, like three weeks ago, I was like, fucking hell, is that my hairline? At the ripe old age of... Uh, 23. 23 now, yeah. <laughs> I was like, God, got to relax more. <laughs> yeah. um, would you say you're young for an entrepreneur? I mean, statistically, yeah, probably. Statistically, yeah. Statistically, yeah. But Do you feel young for an entrepreneur? I, think that's the I feel young, yeah. but I don't feel like my age is impressive. And okay. I'm, the reason I say that is because I'm surrounded by other young entrepreneurs, cool. actually, clients, friends, doing far greater things than I am. Like, people always come to me and say, you've done such, such amazing things for 23, mm. but I'm like, kind of, but I'm not comparing to most 23 year olds. Right. I'm comparing myself to the top 1% of 20 to 25 year olds. Yeah. The people that I grew up playing sport against that are now playing premiership pro rugby every single week. Yeah. The people that are got 5 million listens on Spotify, the people that have million pound businesses, those are the 1% of 20, 20 to 25 year olds that I compare myself to. Yeah. So whilst I see myself as young, I don't see my age as impressive. Okay, I'm going to follow up by asking if you see it as a hindrance. But before I do, if you ever see it as a hindrance, sorry, before I do, because it's hard for me to ask this because I'm I'm 26, so I can't be like back when I was your age. You know, I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> I'm not that much older than you, but I am going to do it. So I think back to when I was 23. I was actually living in we're, we're in your flat in London here. I was I was living in London. I was very lost. I had no idea what to do, and I'm I'm sat across the table from somebody who. If I compare those two people, they're very different people, me at 23 okay. versus you at 23. Um, and so that's when somebody, what would you say to somebody, let's say a potential client you want to sign on, they find out your age. They're like, well, back when I was 23, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. How can I trust someone like you, who actually you have a bit of a track record that you do know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> but what would you say, how would you alleviate that concern if somebody came up to you and go, oh, you're 23, how do I? Yeah. So Does that come up? With, yeah, it used to a lot more than it does now. Yeah. But so I've had to face it a load of times previously. And the answer is, if I can do what I've done at 23, mm. imagine what you can do with five years more experience than me, yeah. 10 years more experience than me. Like, all of our, most of the people that we get into conversations about working with or are working with have at least five, 10, 20 years experience even in their industry. Yeah. So for me, it's a case of like, well, my personal brand is that's obviously what we sell yeah my personal brand is bigger than yours with three years experience yeah. so imagine what i could do with yours with 20. i like that, so that it's is... like it's a little bit of it's almost arrogance but it's no i'd say it's 80 percent confident yeah. <laughs> like, like to bring it back to what you were saying earlier um it's it's on the threshold but it is just about that yeah what i want to follow up from that is um i follow your team on linkedin 
and most of them, most of those guys are pretty young too. How have you been able to find such, because I've, I've met, I've worked with some of your team members. You're actually the person we called when we first signed on our, our biggest client. We were like, we have this huge news to announce. We need an expert. How do we announce this news in, in the right way? And I've worked with some of your team members before and they do know what they're doing. Like you, uh, you wouldn't really assume that they are their age if you didn't know. Mm. Um, so what has your recruitment sort of looked like? How do you generally go out and hire people? Yeah, so it's been a mix of, when I first started hiring at the start of the year, it was incredibly difficult. Like we put out a role and we got probably like four or five serious applicants mm. that we, we consider people that hadn't just copied and pasted a yeah. CV to a hundred different companies. Um, so that was quite difficult. It was a lot of headhunting. Yeah. Um, we had, so I headhunted Isabel, who's now a head of social, recently cool. promoted. Yeah. She was headhunted, Jake, who's just been promoted head of client services. They were the ones we hired in January. Yeah. And they both, uh, Jake actually applied, somehow he saw our job and Isabel headhunted. Since then it's been a mix of headhunting specific people, but then also because our personal brand reach across the team is so big, yeah. we're now in a position where all of the top talent wants to come and work with, with us basically, yeah. which is a very fortunate position to be in. So um, we're kind of flooded with, with good talent, which is a blessing. Our interview processes, uh, I don't really care about people's grades on their CVs yeah. or whatever, or how good it looks. Like it's pretty much anyone can look good on a CV mm. for once for five minutes. Yeah. What I care about more is how good you look over the course of 300 days on, you know, what's your socials like? What's your LinkedIn looking like? Have you been posting? Have you done something outside of um, university or school or your career that shows you're a self starter? Yeah. So you take Izzy, for example, has an Instagram page that she grows. Pretty much everyone we've hired, I think, has had some sort of extracurricular thing, so to speak, yeah. that we look at. That is a big sign for us because it shows they're self starting It shows they can kind of take ownership and take responsibility for themselves. Um, then we just have, I have initial conversation with them, 15 minutes just to kind of check them, basically. Yeah. Um, it's usually just a, a reference checking. And then we go to an interview, interview style conversation. Yeah ask a few traditional questions and then we get them to run through a, we basically give them like a, a personal brand. We might just pick a profile on LinkedIn that we've been following and say, what would you do if you were managing this person? And we actually get them to do the practical steps that they'd be expected to do in, in the role. What kind of stuff do you look for during the, the interview or the interview style? Yeah, process. Process, the way okay. they The way they approach it. Yeah. Like if they're, if they come in and they're not the best writer, mm. no problem, we can train that. But someone that approaches what we do with kind of the right mindset of looking at like, right, what's the, what's the end goal here? What are we actually looking to achieve? Yeah. Our whole philosophy is very purposeful, very practical. We always start with the end goal and work backwards from that. We always try and um, get as much information as we can and formulate a strategy off the back of it. So the people that come in and go, yeah, I'm going to change their profile to this and post this content. It's like, well, great, but why are you doing that? Yeah all of the best ones have come in and they've gone okay so I know this about this person I know where they want to go from their profile it looks like their audience would be these people so what I do is I try and do some research on those people find out what they want to see that's the kind of process of like reverse engineering a strategy that is that we want to see it's very cool I'd never have been hired by <laughs> I, I growing up I worked like uh, I've had a full time job since like I was 14 and I've worked in like banks when I was like 16 and it's all, I, only reason why I got those jobs is I got really good at the interview performance. I could mm. put on a hell of a show. I can tell you about my weakness that is actually a, a strength in disguise. Yeah, classic. And I, <laughs> yeah, I ended up, uh, when I was in London, I was working in, in finance. And it was for this cool startup company. And they had this like culture fit. And it was just, it was so very similar to your thing. They, they want to know your thought process. They want to know how you think, how you get to the end goal. Um, and I was there like with a shirt and like a suit and I was ready to do what I've been doing for the last six years. Um, and I, I ended up becoming friends with the people who did that part of the interview. And they were just like, oh, we liked you. We just, you were way too serious for this kind of, <laughs> I was like, ah, shit. <laughs> so I wouldn't have lasted in, the, in a Karogu interview. <laughs> Before we actually get onto these other questions, there was something you mentioned just before we started recording about uh, about your football career. <laughs> something uh, something at university. Uh, you, I saw you were a captain at University of Birmingham, was it? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, it wasn't such a smooth sailing though. Yeah, so I'd always been quite a 
a key player in all sports teams throughout school and as a kid I'd always been kind of one of the top-ish players captained yeah. a lot of them led a lot of them been senior in a lot of them um, so I kind of I knew university football was a, a bit of a different beast like it's a lot more competitive you're competing with I think there were four or five hundred people at my trial for four spots or something within oh. the teams but I kind of walked in expecting to be I they had so there's six teams at the uni I went to hmm. at Birmingham and I kind of walked in expecting it. if I get into seconds or thirds that's that's the result um, walked in got through the first round of trials second round of trials didn't get in ended up in the sixth team okay so suddenly this is like a massive reality check for me I'm, yeah. I'm obviously pretty pissed off yeah I'm like god I've got to tell my dad now <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's going to be awkward yeah. um, so started in the sixth team but then by the end that was in my first year by third year I was captaining the first team Okay. Um, which was kind of just a process of it's it's a weird character trait that I have right I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing but I'm just ridiculously competitive okay like because that's quite an impressive feat in hindsight yeah the process how how did did that get ugly on yourself did did you or was that more of a because because the way you, you said it you said it was either a good or a bad thing you don't know if it's a good or a bad thing mm. why did you say that because I push myself to limits for right. things that probably aren't wishing my worth pushing myself to that limit to okay like, a levels is a great example and I don't I've never really told this story before but there's certain people at school that I just couldn't face not being better than in yeah. A-levels like I couldn't face getting worse grades with them than them so I spent my last couple of years at school working ridiculous hours putting myself under ridiculous stress to get better grades than them yeah. um, basically I think at the time it was probably an ego thing okay. it probably was um, but I don't know how practical that was because I spent an awful lot of time getting a load of grades that I didn't need just to beat someone yeah. because I was competitive <laughs> but then at the same time like that competitive nature can get you better results yeah. so it's like that's why I don't know if it's a good or a, or a bad thing. In hindsight, do you regret it, though? I, f I feel like I wasted some of my time at school and I could have just relaxed a bit more. But then yeah. I dread to think if I hadn't done it yeah. and I'd got average grades or worse grades than certain people, I'd probably be sat here going, I wish I'd worked harder. Yeah, because I, I am that person. I don't do that well in A-levels. Really? And I, I look back and I think, I wish I'd done more. And from what I can see almost, and maybe I'm, I'm reading the situation wrong, is they seem to have set the foundation for what you you know this this whole football thing um has led you to become i don't know if you can survive in, in business if, you, if you're not at least a little bit competitive yeah. and if you if you're sat here where you are today with the work that you've done here today maybe some of that was attributed to that yeah i mean yeah to be fair like the the actual the actual content that the school system taught me was yeah. pretty useless. I don't remember yeah. any of it. Yeah, yeah. But one thing the school system taught me to do was work ridiculously yeah. hard. And that has stayed with me. Yeah. I I also when I look back, I, I look I, I did I did really well at GCSEs pretty effortlessly. It didn't really I didn't find GCSEs that hard. And I thought I walked in with the same level of cockiness for A levels really? <laughs> and then slapped me in the face. But yeah. I walked in, I was, was like tough. Yeah, I didn't realize it was such a big step up. So I was like, I, I revised a little at GCSEs, got pretty much straight A's. So I went into A-levels, studied a little bit, and came out failing a bunch of exams and getting like E's and D's. Really? I was like, ah, oh, that's a reality check. I'm not that smart. Did you go to uni? Yeah, yeah I went to Westminster. Here Did you London. find Westminster? Way easier. Yeah. But um, I studied media and... I know people who have studied media who have come out with a lot from their degree. Uh, I, I always say this, and I, I hate to crap on a university, but my university, you, like, course was a joke. And, like, you can ask anybody I went to, like, anybody in my course, they all agreed that it was a bit of a joke. But I also had... I saw the other class, like I attended some other classes at the university. I just snuck in with a friend. I actually got an opportunity to see how other universities operate. I actually got to spend some time at the University of Oxford as well. Okay. And that, honestly, not much. I think I was there for a few different things and a few different events. That in particular made me kind of regret not trying as hard. Because really? I was like, if it made me real, it's been a real life lesson, especially more recently so, that life is pretty much you get what you put in. I realized I half-assed a bunch of my A-levels and I half-assed a bunch of my uh, uni and 
that's kind of what I got back in return. I know it has the stigma, but people worked hard to get there. Mm. And I realized what they were getting back was way better than what I got back. I think that was kind of the wake up call I needed. Yeah. Um, Because I think I would have taken a lot more seriously had I gone there. What do you think of, oh, so go ahead. A valuable lesson though, at least like worth learning at at A-levels. There's probably people twice your age that haven't learned that I'm really grateful I learned it then, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) than than much later down the line. What did you think of your uni? Uh, Or sorry, your course more specifically? Uh, Same as you, I thought it was easier than Mm. A-levels. bit of a I don't want to sound like a dick saying this but it was quite easy yeah it was a, I spent more time playing football drinking beer and yeah. building a business than I did on my degree and it came out okay yeah so I read somewhere on a on a blog article that you said that it's very important for you to put your ego aside but in the actual article you mentioned that it's sometimes an asset sometimes a liability could you go into a bit about that um, and maybe an example of, of each yeah so ego being an asset is prime example is like the a-level story that I said oh yeah so yeah. like when you're when you can't face not being better than someone mm. you push yourself to work to yeah. to be better than them and it's not actually the result of beating that person that is worthwhile it's the result of getting more than you would have done if you weren't in that yeah, competition yeah. so like let's say we're competing together to, against each other and I really want to beat you actually beating you doesn't matter that much but Achieving far more than I would have done if I was just competing against myself yeah. is important. Um, and then when it becomes a negative is, this was, I think I know the article you mean, I remember kind of going through this experience when I was starting to build the business. Mm. And I noticed that there were loads of opportunities to, to get new business that people were just turning down left, right and center because it kind of, it didn't look glamorous or it didn't make them, it didn't kind of put them on a pedestal, it didn't serve their ego. But I was like, Take business. I'll take any business I can get. Like yeah. when you're when you're starting a business, you can't really pick and choose. You know, get clients through the door. So I was having like my services sold out through other agencies, mm. basically white labeling me, and they were basically saying that other people didn't want to do this. I was like, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. You take you take all the credit for it. Yeah, go for it. If if I'm getting what I want out of it, yeah. if I'm getting income that's going to help me build the business, you go for it. So there, I really had to put the ego aside and basically not take a take any credit for a lot of the work I was doing hmm. but if I hadn't done it then I wouldn't have had the start that I needed to get to where we are today now you mentioned it ego has no space in your industry though because you've gone from somebody shouldn't have any it shouldn't <laughs> have any but like specifically in your industry you can't it's very hard for you to take credit because you've gone from a place where your services are being white labeled so even the people behind the scenes didn't know it was you putting in the work mm-hmm. to now it's the people behind the scenes know you're taking the work but the audience doesn't yeah it's very uh how does that sit with you i can live with that you can live with that yeah Yeah. i i enjoy it so put it aside and get on with it (laughs) (laughs) something else i wanted to ask you is actually another article which you wrote said you've stopped consuming a a lot of social media specifically i think you've gotten rid of your personal social media your sam winsbury profile is pretty much mostly work now work related and you said it kind of developed some insecurities because of it. And the context of the article was, wasn't was so much like, oh, I want to be like that or I want to be like that. It was more of, um, I haven't reached this goal yet or something. It was a lot more focused around that. I, yeah. I don't think you, you cared how much you looked or anything like that. It was more... I did a bit. But, Again, it comes down to this fact, like throughout, I think second year of uni was probably the worst for it when I was starting to get into business. Yeah. I was comparing myself to like the top 1% of 20-year-olds, Yeah, right, who are doing ridiculously crazy things and I got to the stage on my personal socials where I was just basically seeing people having seeing friends having fun seeing people that I wanted to be like in Dubai or whatever every single week yeah. going why am I not like this I'm working hard but not achieving it got to a stage where even like just felt so insecure in myself even where I, I could barely walk out the house without changing my wow. outfit like three four times to yeah. go to uni like yeah so I deleted it was mainly Instagram, so I delete. I didn't delete. I just deleted the app off my phone. I think the yeah. profile still exists, but I haven't touched my personal Instagram for mm-hmm. since second year of How do you know it was your social media? Because that's where I was seeing everyone. Uh, I probably, see, yeah. probably else. I think it translated into like real life as well. So like yeah. seeing how other people dress and being like, oh, I don't dress like that. All sorts of yeah, things. Yeah. Um, massively helped and just gave me kind of single focus. Yeah. And now, yeah, as you said, all of my social presence is all work related. Yeah. So I have an Instagram but it's just work focus, nothing else. Seems to be very conscious. I think 
I, I've recently gone through very similar. Um, whereas I don't know about, I guess insecurities to some extent, but I realized how much my opinion was being shaped mm. because I I grew up in the north, so that's very sort of left wing. Um, then I worked, I lived in London for eight years, which is traditionally a bit more right wing. And like, I'm using politics as an example because I don't think I've ever been, I've ever leaned to any particular side, but I realized social, when I was in London, that was the biggest contrast, right? Social mm. media was telling me, because that was all my friends from back home, were all saying one thing and the people I was hanging out with was generally saying the complete opposite. Yeah. And I realized I, I've never really formed an opinion on things like that. And I started to notice this trend more and more. Right down to, there was something that like scared me the most. I don't know if I want to talk about it on camera. <laughs> it was like, it was my perception of something. I'll tell you okay. when we stop recording. It was my perception of something. And I realized I was like, I don't even care about that. A another one that I'm happy to talk about on camera was um, cars. I really like cars. And I was, I was seeing all my friends buying new cars and I couldn't financially understand how they did it because I knew what they did for a living. Um, but I'd see that they have all these nice cars. And I was like, well, why don't I have one? Like, I, I want a nice car. I want a nice car. And when I stopped use, I, I deleted Instagram for about three months and I cycle to work now. I realized I didn't actually care that much um, about what, what car I drove. And that's, that, that was the big thing. And I've downloaded it again. I think that break was enough for me to realize I actually don't use, I, since downloading it and I'm on Instagram once a day, if that, for a few minutes. Um, but that was the sort of like purge I needed. Yeah. And I didn't realize how subconscious these things were happening. Because I look at other people now who post and things, and I wonder if they think the same thing or if they think that's just a part of life now. Do you ever wonder that? Yeah, I, I'm i like, personally, I'm like, I don't really, if I was to get a nice car, yeah, it would to be enjoy the nice car. I don't yeah. really care about getting a nice car to show it to other people. Yeah, yeah. I think so many people have that mindset of not actually wanting it, but just yeah. wanting to show other people that they've got it. Um, do you know the worst thing about social, right? Go on. Go to a festival, yeah. go to a sporting event, go to a concert. Yeah. You have paid to be there yeah. and watch this amazing- A lot amazing, of money too. <laughs> yeah, paid a lot of money to watch this amazing performance yeah. in real life. Yeah. Do you know what most people do? Yeah. They watch it through their phone screen that's that big because yeah. they're filming it. Like, what is the point? And I think people, people will go to these events to get that, to put it on their story. Yeah. Just go and experience the event. Just enjoy it and not have to share it with everyone. I'm glad you mentioned that because that was something else. I started off last year wanting to do a bit of a daily vlog on Instagram. Mm. And the, the, the other scary thing was every time I was about to do something exciting, I was thinking about how I could film it. And that's not a problem. That's absolutely fine. It's just I started to realize when I film it, I appreciate it a lot less. Mm. I have this diluted memory that I could experience for a longer period of time. Yeah. But it's diluted. And I always thought, again, it's like something that you feel. But it wasn't. It was only in retrospect that I saw I actually enjoyed that less. In the moment, I thought, yeah, this is fine. Yeah. Um, and so that's what scares me the most. He said with three cameras. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's so <laughs> No, it's different, though. Recording a podcast is different yeah, to that. But I'm yeah. so glad. Yeah. <laughs> it's just almost pivotal to this. Um, cool. Just need one last check. Let's talk about your business. Has it been smooth sailing since day one? I know the answer to this, obviously. It's it never hug? smooth sailing, but yeah. <laughs> um, Absolutely not. But talk me through some of the highlights first. Let's not always go to the negative. Some of the highlights. Yeah. I'll never forget the first kind of proper client I had. So I had a couple consulting gigs. I had one guy in Birmingham Masters at uni paying me, I think it was 17 pound an hour or something, ran a software company in Birmingham, but then in 2020 yeah 2020 i think it was september 2020 it was i was just hammering outreach on linkedin like just speaking yeah. to every kind of ceo founder director that i could and um was following up with everyone 90 percent of people just ignored everything there's one guy i followed up with he said yeah let's actually have a chat this was september of 2020 i was living in my girlfriend's uni house yeah. i'd given myself six months I basically worked out, I had six months of like money left to live. After that, I would have had to go and get a job. Yeah. And then he started working with me. So client, uh, somebody responds Sorry. to you. Yeah. What's your first reaction? Is it yes or is it, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. It's like, well, it was kind of yes. Cause I'd had like a little bit of experience of okay. working with clients, but only on a consulting level previously. So I sold, and like this client itself was quite a small client at the time. It was 300 quid a month. Yeah. But he, name is Guy Littlejohn. 
we worked together for the next well until January of 2022 I was his head of content for a bit he was building a very successful business very exciting business he referred me out to a lot of his clients so that was like a, a key moment just sending a follow-up message and someone actually responding yeah whilst it was very small at the time that turned into something massive and there's no way that I'd be where I am today without that deal and him as like a, a friend and a mentor so um, that was pretty big got quite a few bits of business kind of through his referrals one of them was a like the first high ticket client so to speak in November I think mm. which was like crazy it was like okay I've, I've got a business now yeah yeah right um, and the growth of, off the back end of that year was pretty insane so we went from like pretty much nothing to a pretty healthy base of clients and more than I could handle myself within about six months yeah. so that kind of back end of 2020 start of 2021 was that really exciting phase that's definitely a highlight. I think probably the, the biggest other one is kind of where we are now. Yeah. Like to see where we've got to where people are coming to me saying, you know, you got me into personal branding. I've seen your team everywhere. It looks like you guys are doing amazing work. Just to kind of have that presence and have that impact on the industry. Shit, we're actually doing something pretty cool here. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Probably many more low points <laughs> than highs any any low points you feel comfortable talking about yeah, yeah more than happy to so what are some of the biggest first first week of this year was a tough one yeah I lost about seven grand a month of recurring business in the first week of what you do? no January. kidding what? I, what? <laughs> I, it was it was nothing that we did specifically it was just kind of natural evolution of yeah. people so most of it was one client taking it all in house okay which was a big chunk um, because when you get to that stage, it's like, in fact, two of them did that. Um, but when you get to a stage where like, you're doing it for so many people, it just makes sense to bring it in-house. Yeah. Um, and they offered me to come in-house and do it. Right. But I kind of said, to make a decision, said no, yeah. believe in the business. Um, other people, it's just like new year, new budgets, things changing. So that first week was tough. And I was, I was burnt out. We'd had two team members leave in the couple of months before. Mm. Um, which meant we were just on overdrive. It was literally me and so it was me, Niall, who was our fourth or th fourth or fifth ever team member, um, freelance content creator at the time, just doing like stupid amount like work that should have been done by four people. Yeah, we were cranking out and credit to him for sticking by me then. Um, but he was just a contractor, and then I had Lewis, my now COO, who was also a contractor. Yeah. At that stage, I was pretty much of the view like, pack this in. Really? Pack it in, in the first month of this year. I think the the main thing, I wouldn't say the only thing, but the the big, big reason I didn't pack it in is because I'd agreed to hire someone else. So I'd agreed to hire Jake yeah. a month before. He'd already handed his notice in, quit his job. So I kind of had in the back of my mind, I can't... I it's can't a good pressure, that. Quit, can't really quit <laughs> a business now. Considering where we are now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can't really quit a business now and go yeah. and tell this guy that I've agreed to hire that there's no job anymore. So I kind of pushed through and... Um, obviously got through it things recovered new clients come in you always do get through it um, so that was like that was a very tough period mm. June's been pretty difficult June of this year so June 2020 what are we 2022 now yeah, yeah. <laughs> has been just carnage um, I think the I broke down properly on the first bank holiday of June okay. it was like right at the start there was like uh, Jubilee like bank Jubilee, holiday, yeah, yeah. yeah and I was sat on the sofa there at 1.30 a.m. just in pieces, just like, this is, there's no let up. I can't, can't do this. The pressure of suddenly going from like a, a small business to having like a, a wage bill of, yeah. when you've got to bring in a few hundred thousand pounds before you even make a penny every month, yeah. every year, sorry. It's pretty stressful, right? To have that burden on your shoulders is quite a lot to deal with. And even now I'm still getting used to it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, when you, when you think of a, it's for, did you have a, a have you had a full time job? Never had a full time job. Never had a full time. I've never had an interview. Oh really? Yeah. Interesting. It's very different perspectives, but like from an employee standpoint, you only really see your paycheck, and then you look. I don't know if anybody's ventured to look far enough with what it is before taxes, but that's ultimately what the employer pays, right? Mm -hmm. And then the deductions get made, and you know. From a salary perspective, you feel unjust because that's a lot of money taken out of yours. But that's not it's not kept in the employer's pocket. That's also gone out. So they've paid a high amount. You've received a lesser amount. Yeah. 
And then you think, okay, that, that's, that's not a crazy amount. But once you get to even just five employees, that's a scary number. Yeah. And you say, what, are you up to 15? 15, 15, or you're going to be... 15th joins on Monday, so we're 14 yeah. now. So the easiest way to describe it is if you're, if you're in full-time employment at the moment and you look at your salary, times that by 15 and imagine receiving a bill for that every month. Yeah. It's a scary amount. So I can imagine why um, that must have, you know, there's been occasions where that's been incredibly tough for you. You say the, the whole, was it Jake that you hired? Yeah. You say hiring Jake was, was what kept the pressure on you to, to keep going. What was, that was, that's pressure. What were some of the things that you were thinking or people that were there for you that kept you pushing on? Because yeah. pressure is good. I don't think that was the only thing, though, that, that would have kept you going. Yeah, so naturally put a lot of pressure on myself as well. Yeah. Um, my girlfriend, very fortunate. She was kind of around me at that time. Very fortunate. She's incredibly supportive. Mm. Um, so she was supportive throughout, throughout the period, but was kind of of the view of only do it if you're going to enjoy it. Yeah. Which is totally fair enough. As much as I didn't want to let other people down, I would have regretted letting myself down. I yeah, think yeah. I would have felt like I'd let myself down if I packed it. I also just didn't know what else I'd do. <laughs> like, <laughs> what else could I do if if I pack this in at the yeah. time? So there's kind of no other option. Yeah. But to continue, really, family have always been very supportive. Like I'm very, very grateful for for the support they give. I always say that I'm privileged, but privileged in a weird way. Okay. Right. I wasn't. I started the business with like zero, and I don't mean zero as in. I got like 10 grand from my parents or anything, zero. We were reasonably comfortable, we went through tough times, but it wasn't from like, never been with a silver spoon in my house or anything. Mm. But I am so privileged in the sense that my family never questioned me starting my own business. Mm. They never questioned my career decisions. They supported every decision I made. And that I think is worth far more than any amount of money that they could have given me to start up or, sure. or anything like that. But a lot of people don't have that. A lot of people don't have that support. They've got their parents going, go and get a real job. Yeah, yeah. Get something stable, which if I had that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today. So That's a very interesting point. There's a, there's a book that keeps getting recommended to me and they've told me what the core concept is. I haven't read it yet called The Unfair Advantage. Because mm. you call yourself privileged or, or in, a, in a way of speaking. And the really cool concept about this book is that everybody is privileged. Because I, my, if I think back to like my dad's mentality, it's almost the opposite of that, but not in a negative way. But uh, when I had a relatively stable finance job in London, I was miserable and I wanted to quit it and leave. I had to lie to him and tell him I had another job lined up and that's where I was moving to. But even that to me is, in every weird way, it's, it's an advantage because I got to see his perspective. I have played it safe sometimes, but I, I realized like he's left like war-torn countries. Stability is all that he desires. Mm. And I've never really said like, I, I, I grew up poor or whatever. I grew up in like council estates for most of my life, but I've never really had to question whether I get to eat the next day. And so I've never really, like if I compare myself to people like my peers when I worked in finance and stuff, you could say that but I'd never really consider myself that. But again, from that perspective, I realized I had a lot more hunger and drive than those guys. And it's the whole argument of a lot of people say, um, would you say you've been more creative with your business because you didn't have financial like backings or, or stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Or certainly gone to the depths that I wouldn't have had to. Yeah, because yeah. you mentioned you, you've gone through some pretty unglorious routes to get yeah. the business that you have. And somebody said, uh, we work in e-commerce a lot. and like almost having no budget for marketing is look at Brewdog, what they managed to achieve some of the controversial marketing routes that they've taken not the, the, the working <laughs> let's ignore that scandal for, for the time being but yeah traditionally if you start a business and you have a lot of money an e-commerce business you'll splash it all out on google ads yeah only really piss away most of your money <laughs> but it's the ones it's, it's the brew dogs of the world and the companies like that that tend to be more creative yeah and so that's why i think when people say ah oh, yeah I, I didn't um who don't choose to pursue anything because they, have, they use it as an excuse almost. Like, now nah, everybody has this, and that's why I really want this book. Everybody has an advantage, it's just almost your perspective on it. Yeah. Um, so your perspective seems to be a very healthy one. Yeah, absolutely. You didn't like think, oh, I don't have money and, and shit, I better, I better not do this. Yeah, it's interesting though, because it's also like, it's also a bit of a driver not having money. There's this interesting concept that I've seen a few people talk about, which is where people, People that are like of the upper the upper end where they've got everything, mm. it's quite easy for them to get more. 
Mm. there's people at the bottom end that have literally grown up with nothing and that gives you a bit of grit and drive and ambition to get out of that but actually there's a group of people in the middle that don't really fall into either extreme and I think it's probably harder for them to build successful businesses than people that have literally come (laughs) from from zero because you don't that kind of grit and that determination isn't ingrained in you as much and I don't want that to come across as a very ignorant thing and people to take out of context and say that I'm saying it's easy if you grew up on a council estate to build a successful <laughs> no, business. No. That's of course not what I'm saying. Yeah. But sometimes in the in the terms of the mindset, those people in the middle can struggle yeah. a little bit. You think maybe it's because they have they're worried about they have quite a lot to lose? It's or something to it's lose. Kind it's kind of yeah, it's kind of like they've got something to lose but not yeah. a lot to gain. Yeah, yeah, like okay. They're, they're very comfy. Yeah. But if you're if you're uncomfortable, you want to get out of that, you've got the drive. And if you're yeah. ridiculously comfortable then if you've got 10 million to spend, it's quite easy to make a bit more money. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. A small loan of a, <laughs> yeah, a small loan of a million dollars. Yeah. Um, cool. I've asked most of the things I wanted to ask you, but uh, is there anything you wanted to cover that I didn't ask you? Is there, is there a question I should have asked you that I, I haven't? You get to, you get free roam here, man. You get That's to ask a question. Anything. Yeah. Um, it's my favorite one to ask. It's minimal effort from me. What is, what's your plan for career in the future? What, yeah, I, shit, that is actually a question. <laughs> no, sorry, the question I had, to be brutally honest, because it might be on camera, so I can't lie. Um, do you have any personal goals over the next few years? But ignore that. Where's Kuroga going in the next five years, did you say, or a few years? A few years, five. few years. Five years, if we do it in a few, even better. Yeah. So, yeah, we want Kuroga to be the go-to personal branding agency globally. Mm. So when any entrepreneur, founder exec thinks of personal branding anywhere in the world we want them to go i should speak to Kuroga. Mm. so we want to kind of change the industry be at the forefront of the industry and really define what personal branding is over the next few years offer the most comprehensive personal branding service essentially that's available and provide it to as many of the world's most exciting people as we possibly can that's the mission and if this hour-long conversation has been proof of anything, you don't plan on stopping until you get there, do you? No, even if, <laughs> it's, even if it becomes completely irrational for me to keep pursuing it, I will keep pursuing it. Fantastic. <laughs> so Sam, I'm super grateful for your time. I really appreciate you joining me here um, or letting me come to you, into your flat. And oh, <laughs> doing this. Thanks for making the trip. Really yeah. appreciate it. No, it's been a pleasure. Um, normally, we ask the guests to look into our camera and say, please subscribe. Would you mind? Definitely subscribe. (laughs) (laughs) Cheers.